service of our God and our country. A doctor, a pediatrician held in the highest regard. Yes, he is a four-star or a former four-star admiral in the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps, a former assistant secretary for health, a former member of the country's coronavirus task force and the country's COVID-19 testing czar. But more than anything, if you get to know Brett, he's just a man of faith, a husband, a father, a grandfather, a doctor, and public servant, and a servant of God, and most importantly, one of us. Thank you, Brett. Cheers. Um, that was an introduction worth waiting for. Uh, I'm happy Stan wasn't up there again this morning. But thank you for, thank you for all of your, your work, um, you know, making this weekend just spectacular as it is. Can I have my title slide up there? Uh, so this morning is something a little bit different. You know, uh, the, the sermons yesterday morning were really challenging for me because that's something I don't do. Last night was more in, uh, I sort of lived that for the past 18 months, so it's easy to talk about that, and the problem was just selecting things. Um, today, I really want to have a conversation, and the conversation is about uh, our healthcare system and the public health in the United States, which is really what I went to government for. I did not go there to be the testing czar to do COVID. That's something that happened. But my position, the Assistant Secretary for Health, is a senior public health official in the country. That doesn't mean I get to do Obamacare or abolish it or change Medicare but it really tries to set what the public health agenda should be. So we do a lot of policy things like um, wh what should nutrition be for the country? What should be the exercise? What's the national plan for HIV and hepatitis? We ran, I was the national, I ran the national vaccine program. So I was the leader of the national vaccine program. That's why it's in the office of the secretary. So this is what I really went to Washington to do. And I wanna talk a little bit um, about some of the underlying problems and uh, I haven't started on book number two, but this is going to be book number two because it really needs to be talked about. And I have a few slides to get through, but then I think we'll have 20 or 25 minutes to talk about things. And I do need to hop on a, on a plane this morning. I don't mean to be rude. I stayed around all last night and after, but I have to get going. So I want to talk about that. So this is mostly from before the pandemic, but it's, it's actually gotten worse. So I, I want to sort of lay... I'm not gonna talk about an individual with a heart attack or an individual with diabetes or a person needs neurosurgery. I wanna talk about the big sort of public health picture in the country. So where we are right now is we are spending almost 18% of our gross domestic product. That's $3.6 uh, trillion expected to reach 19% by 2027. So this is an enormous amount of money that we spend on our healthcare system, far in excess of any other uh, uh, developed country, and I'll, I'll show you some some comparisons. The problem is, though, although we spend the most, we don't get the we don't get the most. We rank about 28th in life expectancy, 34th in infant mortality, 33rd in suicide. And if you look on that right side of the graph, it you know you don't have to know all these things, but if you look at the lower corner, that's countries of the 44 that had uh, low spending and low life expectancy. In the upper left is low spending, high life expectancy. In the upper right is high expenditures, high life expectancy. And in the lower right is very high expenditures all the way to the right and low life expectancy. And we're the only country in that quadrant. Okay. So, you know, if you look at this objectively, we really have a problem. We're spending the most and we're getting the least out of it. That doesn't mean if you have brain cancer, you're gonna, not going to get the best care in the world for that. But I'm talking about overall public health in the country, not specific episodic care. In 2015 and 2017, uh, despite the most uh, insurance that we've ever had coverage, life expectancy went down in the country, and it went down by a lot. And I'm going to go back and talk about why in 2018 and 2019 life expectancy went up dramatically, uh, which had nothing to do with healthcare. It had to do with a lot of other factors. And the most important thing I want to say on this slide, too, aside from just the overall picture, is that 90% of our annual health expenditures uh, are expended for people with chronic conditions. It's taking care of people with chronic conditions. So I want to sort of paint that, um, not to be negative, but I'm just going to paint a picture of kind of where we are overall in the public health, 
because we're going to have to deal with this, right, in one way or shape or another. Number one, we want better. Out I, I'm almost fine with spending more money if we get the better outcomes to do it, okay? So it, next slide. Any questions about that slide? Because I'm happy to answer a question. Okay, now this is another really, really critically important slide. This is not controversial. This is not Republican, Democrat, you know, anything else. What accounts for the overall health, meaning life expectancy and quality of life in this country. And this is a very important, very important piece. And I want to go to the bottom of it. Healthcare accounts only 20% of our overall health outcomes. About half of that 20% is access into the healthcare system, and about half of it is uh, the quality of care you get. So our overall life expectancy in this country and our quality of life has only 20% to do with healthcare, but we focused almost all our resources on that, on that small bit, and we wonder why we don't change it. Um, on the top is really socioeconomic factors. So these are, uh, these are issues like education, job status, income, community safety. That accounts for 40% of the overall health outcomes in the country. The physical environment, very, very important, accounts for about 10%. And, uh, That is a heavy podium. Um, and then health behaviors, which we always talk about, tobacco use, diet and exercise, alcohol use, sexual activity, but I will, I will make the case that even our health behaviors uh, relate enormously amount to the upper panel, the socioeconomic factors that we deal with, and I'll give you some examples about that. So if we really want to improve the overall health of our country, Yes, it's important for healthcare access, and yes, it's important for quality, but we're gonna have to deal with these other factors. And when we think about health, most people don't think about these other factors, which are the predominant determinants of the outcomes in this country. Next slide. I'm just gonna give you a couple examples. I give you a dozen examples, but um, about half of US cancer cases are completely preventable in this country. It is nice to cure cancer. I would love to cure cancer, but we can take almost half of them off the board immediately by doing things like cigarette smoking, uh, excess body weight, about 8% of preventable cancers, uh, eight, per, 8 of that 42% are due to obesity. It's associated with esophageal cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, so many other ones. It's directly related to obesity because obesity changes your entire metabolic milieu. Uh, down there are some things, physical inactivity, uh, HPV infection, that's 1.8 out of the 4 Point two. So, you know, there are 40,000 cases a year of cervical cancer or oral pharyngeal that can really be prevented, one, well, not 100, it's about 95%, just with vaccines. Next slide. I put this one up because everybody wants to cure Alzheimer's disease, and I want to cure Alzheimer's disease. My grandmother died a miserable death after 20 years. Uh, this is very interesting, though, in Chicago. Um, if you had a drug that could reduce your risk of Alzheimer's by 60%, it would make a trillion dollars, right? It really would. But if you can just do four out of these five activities, a high-quality diet, engagement in cognitive activities, that could be bridge, that could be Sudoku or whatever it is that people use, any kind of cognitive activities, coming to lectures, cognitive activities, regular physical activity, and again, you don't have to run a marathon, you just have to have regular activity, garden, walk, you know, those kind of things to have physical activity. Um, you can have light to moderate alcohol intake. You just can't have a lot. Um, it doesn't mean you, you don't have, doesn't mean you have to have light alcohol intake, but if you have light to moderate, as long as you don't have excess, and not smoking, you can reduce your uh, chances of Alzheimer's by 60%. So these are the kind of things that, you know, we, we, we're so involved in a drug culture of treating things when we can do some simple things to prevent. Next slide. Um, when I talked about, you know, socioeconomic factors and things like addiction, I talked last night that our overdose deaths are going to be over 100,000 because of the loneliness, despair that's associated with the pandemic. It's up about 35% year to year. But this is just a good example, uh, and this was just really excellent study. It was published in JAM. I just did the New York Times headlines. But it showed that uh, when uh, car factories closed down, when we had the, the big issues with... Uh, the economy and car sales, that uh, drug overdose deaths went up 85% in each one of those communities uh, compared to ones where the car factories were open. So there is a direct link, as you might understand. If you lose your job, 
uh, you lose hope. Um, uh, you probably also lose your health insurance, but you lose hope. You tr tend to turn to alcohol and drugs. And this is just a good example of how the economic factors play directly into even things like addiction. Next slide. Um, this is still the best study and one of the most concerning to me. And uh, one of my offices at, uh, in my office was the Office of um, Minority Health, which really dealt with disparities. But let me orient you to this. Um, the bottom line this is uh, there are tremendous inequalities in life expectancy in the U.S., and your zip code matters much more than your genetic code. Uh, and uh, what this is showing you is if you're in a, a dark red area, your life expectancy is in the mid-60s. If you're in uh, a dark blue area, your life expectancy is in the mid or higher 80s. And you can look at uh, community by community where one zip code is in the 80s and only one zip code away is in, is in the 60s. And this really deals with socioeconomic factors and all those factors we talked about on that first slide. And the most important, the, the, the worst thing is our difference of 20.1 years within the United States is about the same difference between the United States and the lowest income countries in the world. So our disparities in the United States within our country are about the same as the disparities between the United States and you pick the nation in the middle of Africa. So that's how bad our disparities are across the country. And that relates really to zip code, not genetic code. And when I mean zip code, that means physical factors, that means economic factors, everything else. Um, and there's some good, there's some, you know, good, lots of good backup about this. Next slide. Um, the COVID pandemic has made just about everything I talked to you about worse. And I, I'm not depressing, I'm just trying to lay a picture of sort of where we are um, across every parameter. And we talked last night about addiction, about uh, emotional issues in children. But let me just, uh, this is a, a, something new from the Trust for America's Health. Next slide. So uh, this is a very recent survey that showed that 61% of Americans during the pandemic had an undesired weight change since the start of the pandemic. And I think we all kind of know that. If you just look at all U.S. adults, and I'll just show you the chart on the right side, 42% of Americans had an undesired weight gain, and the average weight gain was 29 pounds. 18% of Americans had an undesired weight loss, which is even as bad, and that average weight loss was 26 pounds. So these are enormous trends when you look at what obesity is going to do to diabetes, heart disease, cancer, you know, everything else. And you can just go down. Nobody's immune. You know, the, the Gen Xers, the millennials, millennials, the Gen Zers, everybody is in that. Essential workers, 50% had an undesired weight gain of 38 pounds. 24% had an undesired weight loss of 30 pounds. So our essential workers, um, just based on the weight factor, which is sort of a summary of all kind of things, three quarters of them had a disastrous year during the pandemic, so it's going to affect them for many years to come. So um, I think this was just sort of a good illustration. I think we all know that, right? Uh, we've all, you know, had, had those kind of issues, or many of us had that. So, okay, I want to spend a lot of time on this, and I want to, I want to talk about this. Um, I had like nine months before I, between the time I was intended to nominate and got in the office and spent a lot of time working on, uh, OASH was my office, Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health, and this is what I uh, presented to my office three days after I got in, and I, and I, I want to just talk about these a little bit as principles and then spend you know, a lot, some time for discussion. I think these are nine words that we have to focus on to really change our healthcare system. Um, and I'll go through each of them. Number Health for all, health by all, and health in all. Now, you have to be a little kitschy if you're going to have a slogan, right? You can't, can't be 27 paragraphs and, you know, have a bunch of equations. Um, but, but this is something I wanted everybody to understand. It really drove all the policies for the office, and I think it needs to drive the health care agenda in the future. Um, health for all is, is this. Assure that everyone has a fair and realistic opportunity to optimize their health. Um, I, I don't know any other principle that would be any more based in Christian principles than fairness and opportunity, no matter, no matter who you are. I put a couple things there that are a little bit nuanced, um, and that is, um, at least from my points of view, and this is partially, you know, my ideology, um, 
we want to make sure people have a fair and realistic opportunity. It doesn't mean that everybody's health has to be equal, right? Because at the end, people are going to make choices, and you have to, you have to, you have to really respect that, at least from my point of view. Um, you know, there are many countries in the world that if you want to buy a sugar soda, it's going to cost you $15. That's, I mean, Finland taxes this over and over again, and they really try to control like what you do at every step of a, you know, in my point of view, um, that's not where we need to go, but we need to make sure that people can make a different choice and have the opportunity. If you live in a food desert, uh, you should be able to have fresh produce there and not just go to 7-Eleven and eat, you know, chips and those little hot dogs that go on those little things. I don't know what's in there, but I, I've never really tried that. And, and this, this is really sort of, sort of the, the understanding of health disparities and equality. I also put this, and in, in this can get kind of controversial, but having insurance does not mean you have better health, okay? Um, it, and what I mean by that is the Affordable Care Act um, philosophically is a great thing, and it has made sort of impacts at many different levels. But despite the Affordable Care Act, health disparities got worse in our country. Life expectancy went down. There's a couple reasons for that. Number one is it's only 20% of the problem, right? If you have a terrible environment and you have all, you know, you can't solve that. Um, secondly, it's sort of the wrong kind of health care. People um, used it for emergency room visits and things like that instead of having primary care that can move everything upstream. So insurance is necessary, but it's not sufficient, right? You have to move the whole system to the left to preventative care. Just because you can get your amputation paid for when you have diabetes, okay, that's okay, but what we really want you to do is have your diabetes treated or to be able to have good nutrition and resources so you don't get diabetes to begin with. So we have a lot more work to do that. Okay, health by all. Distribute and democratize healthcare knowledge, capabilities, and deliveries. What I mean by that is that healthcare uh, has to get more in the community. It has to be not just at UT Southwestern, where I was, where you go and you go behind that, but it has to be at your church. It has to be... Uh, if you're a rural, it has to be in your county agent. Um, healthcare has to be distributed, and we need to give people power. That could be uh, apps to help them, tools. It could be home diagnostics. It could be anything that allows you to take better care of your health. Now, we all did our home glucose monitor, right? So we know about that. But what's the next real steps that we do? Um, something simple is ma for maternal mortality, which has gotten really bad in this country. Um, if we just allow uh, pregnant moms to test the protein in their urine at home, you could detect this preeclampsia hypertension that risks children very early. We don't do anything like that. So the whole, the whole thrust is to really make sure that we democratize healthcare knowledge so people know what to do and we empower them to do that with tools that they could take care of themselves at home. The third is prioritize health considerations in all sectors and policy areas. Um, since... Uh, uh, and let me just give you an example. Uh, you know, before the pandemic, there was talk of a trillion dollar infrastructure bill. So it's really nice to build bridges, right? I'm all for building bridges. But what about building sidewalks so children could walk to school or ride their bikes? What about building parks? What about having places to exercise? So everything that we do, because health is not just about medicine, it's about everything there. Everything we do has to have a health component in it. And I, these are sort of, philosophical considerations, but I really think if we approached our healthcare policy uh, by these principles, uh, we would be much better off in the end. Um, I want to give you a couple of examples that are counter, um, that are specific examples of things we did that are, that sort of follow this, but they really are specific initiatives that I was involved in to, 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 to show you, uh, you know, some of the things we did that didn't get a lot of press. So next slide. Um, one thing I was very pleased about, and the, and the president was very, um, he was very personally involved with this because of the issues of addiction in his family, um, with uh, alcoholism and alcoholism deaths in his family, was that very early um, we made the decision, and it was the right decision, to treat addiction, substance use disorder, as an illness. It is a chronic brain disease. It is not a fault of character. Um, this was perhaps easier um, uh, in this administration because, let's face it, the people who were addicted were uh, generally white, generally affluent, and they were generally high school or college people who got on opioids. 
So it was a lot easier to make the case than what it was sort of in the 80s or 90s when that demographic was not the predominant involved. But we did declare it as a public health emergency and treated it that way. Um, all through, even the DEA uh, uh, administrator, uh, I think I was sitting with, uh, yeah, the DEA administrator was there around the president. We were briefing the president uh, about uh, many of these initiatives. Uh, Homeland Security was there. Uh, but we all really said uh, the goal is not to make bad people good, it's to make sick people well. And addiction is going to be one of the major issues that we're going to have to face over the next 10 years. Again, 100,000 U.S. deaths over the last 12 months just because of opioids and methamphetamine. Next slide. Um, HIV. Uh, you know, I always felt, uh, I, this is one of the things I got a little bit, you know, upset about that you know, the administration was homophobic or transphobic or anything like that. Um, HIV is a disease of uh, poor black homosexual men and transgender women. It is no longer a disease of stockbrokers in San Francisco who go and party and have, you know, promiscuous sex. This is a disease of poor people, primarily minorities, also tribes, um, and transgenders in the United States. And, you know, there is no reason why we can't eliminate HIV. Uh, there is no reason. We have 40,000 new cases of HIV every year, um, and we are still at a situation that one out of every two people with HIV have it for three years before they're diagnosed, and one out of five have full-blown AIDS before they're diagnosed. So this is a problem of early diagnosis. Um, if you are diagnosed early and you get on treatment, you cannot pass HIV to anyone else. Undetectable equals untransmittable. So if we find a person who is independent of behaviors, okay, we know all the behavioral issues, but if you find a person, you get them on treatment, they can't transmit it. If they're at risk um, and they don't change the behaviors, uh, there's a, a drug called PrEP, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis, that you take it and it reduces your risk to essentially zero, no matter what you do. Uh, we were able to start, uh, and the president announced this, um, uh, President announced this at the State of the Union in 2019. I briefed him on it. He was very excited about it. Uh, I was actually off-site. I was one of the designated survivors during that. So uh, God help us. And we're glad nothing happened because the two senior designated survivors off-site were Rick Perry and myself. So, <laughs> we're, we're all praying for everybody to be safe for more than one reason. By the way, on the previous slide, um, put the previous slide up. Um, when we were around the Oval Office that day, uh, Melania rarely was in the Oval Office, but she was very concerned about children uh, who were born uh, of, sub of parents with substance use disorders. Um, you're not born addicted. Addicting means you have a mental you know, a craving for it. Children don't have a mental craving, but they're physically dependent on it. And... Uh, she was very, you know, I traveled a lot with her, and she was very involved in the children. But in this briefing, um, the, president, uh, the president often had colorful language, uh, shall I say, very colorful language. And he, he used an off-color term, and uh, literally Melania kicked him under the, under the resolute <laughs> desk about as hard as I saw and said, Donald, behave yourself. So <laughs> next slide. So ending HIV, and this is really, this is, this is absolutely uh, continued under the Biden administration. Actually, uh, the, the Congress actually increased the funding that we requested for it yesterday, but it's something I was very proud of. And by the way, PrEP is very expensive. Uh, it can be uh, up to twenty dollars or $30,000 a year for that. Um, if you're on Medicaid, you're covered. If you're insurance, you're covered. But people who have nothing, have nothing. So we... Um, got work with Gilead, and they donated uh, $11 billion worth of PrEP. So anybody who could not get it through Medicaid or through um, their insurance had a free program. All they had to do is literally sign up online, and it would get PrEP free for life. So we were able to work with private industry to get that done. Next slide. Um, we really worked hard on some of the upstream factors. And again, you you have to be opportunistic, right? You have to be opportunistic with this. Uh, Trump was very much into team sports, and he really enjoyed team sports growing up. And we really leveraged that. The President's Council on Sports, Fitness, and Nutrition was again in my office. 
Um, we tried to do things like the first federal strategy to increase youth sports participation, and Johnny Damon's there and Ivanka were really the two that were really working hard on this. Um, the average cost to participate in a team sport now in the United States is $500 per sport per season. Okay, this means everybody in lower income communities cannot participate in team sports. It also means that uh, girls' uh, participation is just crashing because it's very expensive. So this got started, it got kind of killed because of the pandemic, although it's still there. But we wrote a comprehensive strategy to increase youth sports participation. We put the first $20 million in grants out to local areas uh, to provide that we wanted to grow. But this is the kind of thing that people can really um, get them on that track to physical fitness, but also team sports teaches you how to be a team, right? It teaches you how to win, it teaches you how to lose, it teaches you're dependent on others, all the kind of social skills that we want. You know, chill. I'm big on team sports. I mean, I played team sports, and so we worked on that. Physical Activity Guidelines for America, we talked about that, um, and um, those are all published. And again, we tried to make them accessible, and the data show that you don't have to run marathons. If you have, your, your goal is 150 minutes of physical activity per week, um, and that's moderate activity like walking, and that's not, it's not that much, um, you know, that's whatever it comes down, 150 divided by seven, you know, so 25 minutes a day, um, and that's really all you need. You can get more benefit by doing more, but the curve really flattens off. So if you go to 200 minutes, you only get a little bit more incremental benefit, 250 minutes. And it's also good for all of you there to do some kind of weight training, um, uh, it, whether that's weights or you know doing squats or doing something that uh, exercises the muscles in addition to the cardiovascular. Just do that twice a week for just a short period of time, and you sort of maximize your physical benefits. Next slide. Um, I'm glad I was in the back row on this. Uh, I was FDA commissioner uh, when this happened, but. Um, uh, for some reason, the president decided it was a good idea to have all the anti-smoking activists and R.J. Reynolds and Jewel and everyone in the same room in the cabinet room for a massive cage match. Um, and we were going to have a massive cage match with everybody there. And then the president walks in and said, invite all the media in, which was not planned at all. So we, this was in September, uh, December uh, of, uh, it wasn't December, I think it was in September. That must have been an updated one. Um, I don't think it was in December. Um, it was before the pandemic, so everybody was packed into that room, um, uh, and there was a lot of shouting back and forth uh, because, you know, uh, e-cigarettes had, like, bubble gum and pineapple flavor, and kids were just, you know, all getting addicted to this nicotine. They were really nicotine delivery systems. So uh, at first, the president uh, said he was going to ban all of this. I think that was in September or August, and then... He said, uh, no, this, was, this was, had to be in November or December. Then he took it all back and said, we're not going to ban any of it. Uh, both of those were probably wrong positions. I became FDA commissioner. The secretary and I were extremely, uh, uh, you know, we wanted to ban most of the, most of the flavors for, for all the reasons. But there was uh, a large lobby on the other side, and a lot of the Republican constituents you know, uh, wanted to have e-cigarettes sort of freely. So this was a very big battle. Um, but we were able to do what we needed to do. And in fact, after all this, we were in the Oval Office, the pre uh, Secretary and I with the President, and he said, go work it out and come to consensus. And he said, we can't come to consensus. I mean, I have the President of Juul and I have the President of Tobacco Free Kids all in the same room. We're not going to get a consensus because we're on opposite sides. Because he really liked to get consensus, which is good, but you couldn't get it here. And then he said, okay, okay, you're not going to get consensus. Write, write something up for me. Write something up for you? Yeah, go write something up for me. So the secretary and I go right outside the office. We, there's an assistant there. We take over the computer. We, will, we write a presidential memo about what we wanted. Uh, the secretary actually said he'd bet me a dollar that the president would never sign it. Uh, and he put the dollar on the table. We went, went back in, and the president signed it. So that's how it happened. And we banned all flavors except menthol. And the reason why we didn't ban menthol is because children don't use menthol, number one, and there was new data on that. Number two, uh, menthol cigarettes are very popular, especially um, in African-American community, and it's been used as a way to sort of hook them because menthol sort of genetically with, taste, with the taste in African-American communities, is they're very susceptible to that. 
So if you take menthol off the market, you also take um, e-cigarettes are much better than combustible tobacco, and we needed to keep menthol as an off-ramp for people. So kids weren't using it, and we wanted to keep the on-ramp on. So that was the story of that. And I, I'm going to be done in a second. So next slide. Um, healthy people, um, I would advise you to look at this. This is another product out of my office, and it comes out every 10 years. And it really is the report card and the objectives for the American healthcare system. It, 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 there used to be 1,200 objectives. I said, if you have 1,200, you have none. So we reduced the objectives to 350, and there are 23 leading health indicators. So if the U.S. could do these 23 things and follow them, um, our health, that first slide would be completely turned around. Now, it's not all the health indicators because some can't be measured. So if, you, if there's not a good measurement tool right now, we didn't put them in there because if you can't measure them, they can't be an indicator. Um, we put those as tools that you could move to the future. If you go to Healthy People 2030, there are 23 leading indicators. Um, but one of the things we put in this version um, is a lot of the social determinants of health. It's not just keeping your glucose under control, but it's the kid, uh, children who could read by fourth grade. Um, it's a lot of the issues like that, people who, who are employed, employment in your community, because these really have the effects on health much greater than anything else. So I, this is a really, if you go to, the, go to Healthy People 2030, go to the leading health indicators, and if you really want to know um, how to improve health, this is it. And we also put a community guide together, what every community can do to help achieve these indicators with real life examples, so real practical stuff. And the last slide. Next slide, um, and then ask some questions. This, this is the most important piece for healthcare reform ever in the future, and I believe that. Um, and we got partially down the way, particularly with some things like kidney disease. Um, the health system right now pays for procedures, right? Um, when I was an ICU doctor, if a person didn't get a measles vaccine, um, uh, they could be in my ICU. It could be a million dollars in charges with measles, pneumonia. Healthcare system pays for that. If you need an amputation, it pays for that. Um, where, where we need to go in the future, um, and we're just scratching the surface, is called value-based transformation. And this is very, very important and very difficult, and we've lost the momentum, and there's nowhere we're going to get there in the next three or four years. But the goal here is to pay to keep people healthy, to maintain their health, uh, and not to pay them when they're sick, okay? This does an enormous amounts of things. Um, just think if your local physician could help you with food plans, and that could be paid for. Uh, what if they could help you with transportation? Um, what if they could uh, provide some of the social services that you need, like uh, a social worker, when you're changing jobs, all to be helped through the healthcare system. Um, that's the idea of value-based transformation. The healthcare system will like it because it allows the healthcare system to pay for some of the 80% of other things that really affect your health, not that 20%. The healthcare system loves it because it gets the government off their back. We don't care about you document, you know, when you go to a doctor, all they do is type in the thing. We don't care about that. All we care about is the health outcomes of the people you manage. It doesn't matter whether you document, I looked in the ear and the ear had no wax in order to get paid. So the healthcare system likes it. The insurance system could like it. Um, they could like it because it really decreases the overhead and all this bureaucracy. But this is really where we need to go um, it, to really change the system around to paying for keeping people healthy and maintaining their health. Not that you don't. Um, do all the health care you need at the end when they can't maintain their health. But the more people are healthy, the actually more the health care providers will make because they don't expend all that money, and the healthier the population is. We're seeing this around the edges. When I mean around the edges, and this is the last thing, there are small companies that, um, that will take high-risk populations like out of Medicare. So a very high-risk population that maybe has... Uh, uh, have been in the hospital, you know, 20 times in a year. And what they're saying is Medicare or Medicare Advantage plan, you pay me 80% of what you're paying to take care of them, and I will take all the risk on those people, okay? And one of my friends is doing this right now on the rural side. 
Um, but what they're doing with that 80% is they're not just paying for their hospital care. They have concierge services. 24 hours a day, they can call someone. EMTs go out and help them. So they're paying for all the things to keep them healthy and keep them out of the hospital. That's where it's starting, but it's going to you know, continue after that. So I, I just wanted to provide some thoughts about sort of uh, at a very high level, the healthcare system, where we are. Um, uh, I'm going to New York City. Okay, I'm meeting with 12 fund managers that manage $100 billion of funds tonight. And my pitch to them is you have health funds that do cancer. You have health funds that do all of this. I want a health fund that deals with health disparities. The country has not done anything right with health disparities. You know, the cities are actually getting worse and worse. Why don't we do a fund that we invest in private companies whose goal is to reduce health disparities? So I'm going to see if I can, you know, squeeze them out of a few hundred million dollars tonight <laughs> so we can start a fund because, you know, I'm not anti-government, but the government hasn't solved this. We're, we're, we're the same or we're getting worse over years. Let's try to get some private ingenuity around this uh, with, uh, and how to turn this around in the country. So we'll see how it goes. I don't know how they're going to uh, react to that. They don't know that's what I'm going to talk about tonight, but they invited me, so I'm going to talk to them about it. So let's start a discussion. Uh, questions or just comments? Yes, ma'am. You're 75? Oh my goodness, I want what you're doing. Yes. Yes. Having great money, maybe four nail, maybe seventy-five, it was considered one glass of wine, because I only get five or eight ounces, five times a week. That is a heavy drink. So um go ahead. Okay, two comments. One is getting the word out you said for prevention. I agree with that, but the word out is not enough in my mind, it's creating the business case for it. Um, if you reward behaviors like through the healthcare system to support prevention, most physicians, and I'm not negative about physicians or nurses, but they don't get paid for keeping you healthy. They get paid for seeing you um, and taking care of you know, conditions when they occur. So not only do we need the word out, but we need to align the incentives to help keep people healthy so that we're all aligned here. If we do that, we're gonna save half, half the healthcare costs People will be healthy and people will make more money anyway, right? Um, the, the second thing is, yeah, and we had this big fight. Uh, it was a huge fight because the dietary guidelines for America, um, uh, because it came down to one glass of wine a day versus two glasses of wine a day. And uh, the, the, uh, the official recommendations uh, in the dietary guidelines is no more than two glasses of wine a day, Okay. But the data are pretty strong that it should be one. Uh, but it was sort of right on the edge, and it was, a, it was just a huge controversy to get things out. But that's sort of in the range uh, of what is considered, you know, moderate, acceptable, you know, alcohol drinking. Yes, sir. Oh. Do schools still do physical education? Very few of them do that. Physical education has really been deprioritized in the school, both, both in terms of funding and for lots of reasons. And physical education isn't what physical education used to be, too. It's sort of like, you know, go in the gym and do your iPad for a while. Um, so uh, I, I'm a firm believer that we need, number one is younger children don't need physical education. They just need to be allowed to play. Um, your granddaughter, my granddaughter, you put them in a the yard, they're going to run around. They're going to run around, you know, so just act, the, the recommendations for children is just allow them to play. Um, and then when you get older, uh, I do believe physical education is very important. And, and I, I do believe team sports is, is just a major thing to, because it's more than physical education, it's emotional education that they get for that. But yes, every, every chance you, you can get, try to support physical education because you, gotta, you, know, you can't change your life in one moment. Some people do, but it's more of a habit that you build throughout your life. And thank you so much for you know, for, uh, for, for bringing that up. 
Yes, ma'am. Sure. To share with people that might support efforts in our area to give these at-risk communities glasses. Yes, absolutely. And um, actually, if I'll put a note to Jill, but I can give you links for like the physical activity guidelines, the community guide that shows communities simple things that they could do, because we've got all the tremendous resources. Pardon me. And access to help you mention three churches. We oh. So, so let me just give you an example, and this is one thing that I'm going to try to do. Um, chronic kidney disease uh, leading to dialysis, uh, it takes about 15% uh, uh, of the entire Medicare budget. It's just on end-stage renal disease. If we did, uh, if we took everybody who was at risk for end-stage renal disease, that, that's mostly people with diabetes and hypertension, and... Uh, we did a simple blood test and a urine dipstick. We can tell very early on who's going down that road. There are good medications to prevent that. Um, uh, I had the American Society of Nephrology, the kidney doctors, do a study for me that if we were able to screen everybody and got them on the drug, what would happen? Uh, we would save uh, 100,000 lives a year and 150,000 new people on dialysis a year. Uh, just by doing that. This is the kind of things that you can do in your church, right? Um, you know, uh, uh, when we were talking about COVID testing and everything, we went through the church. HIV screening, um, the way to reach the population in Georgia, Mississippi, uh, Alabama is through the churches, right? That's the way that we really reach for HIV screening, destigmatizing it. And there were great people destigmatizing it. I was in Miami um, at one of the centers in Miami. And there was a, it was great. I don't I remember her name, but I got a picture with her. There's a Catholic nun about this tall. But she was there doing HIV screening in transgender Hispanics in Miami. Because, let's face it, God would want us to do HIV screening in transgender because we need to help people. That's what it's all about. So she was there setting the example to destigmatize that. And it was just really, you know, special. So I firmly believe, particularly... Um, uh, in, in hard to reach populations, uh, particularly particularly in the South. I'm gonna say in the South is where, you know, the Southern band is where all the poor health is. And if you looked at that chart, a lot of those red areas around the South, the ones that weren't in the South were uh, on, in American Indian, the tribes. They were in the tribes or the native uh, Alaskans in, in Alaska. But it's really the South that we need to get to. And, you know, churches rule in the South, right? That's where we have to go. Yes, sir. Yeah. Does that mean people don't have access and don't use it, or they go to the doctor and don't listen to the doctor? Or um, no, the list. So the twenty percent, uh, half of that is access, and half of that is quality. Um, so so um, if you have access, but your doctor doesn't know what they're talking about or doesn't have quality care, it doesn't really help you. So it's about half and half. Look, access is important. I'm not arguing against access, but what I'm saying is access without quality of care and prevention doesn't do you very much and you can't ignore the other 80%, right? If you have good access to care and you smoke five packs of Camel a day, you're still gonna have bad health, right? So it's, uh, I, I am all about access, but what I'm trying to say is when we start talking about spending $6 trillion on the medical care system, probably we ought to be spending $3 trillion of that on the other 80% and $3 trillion on that bottom 20%. And this is, this is all the things that, and again, back to the church, I think the church could have enormous influence on how we, you know, work, you know, work together and create those, create those behaviors. Um, yes, ma'am. Next. And then. Uh, why so many people won't take the COVID vaccine? I, um, so, it, okay, it's, it's a million dollar question, right? Or a trillion dollar question, gazillion dollar question. Um, you know, a, a lot of people didn't take it early because it wasn't approved. And you could make that argument, right? Because it's only authorized, it's not approved. Um, it, and and a, a whole slew of people, once it got approved, went in to take it. There are some people who are just anti-vaccine and won't do anything. Um, and we talked about this last night, but I think it's been really politicized. Uh, you know, it, it's like a political talking point. Um, and I'm going to 
really a stereotype here, but on the Democratic side, it's like vaccines are the only thing that could save the world. You know, everybody has to get a vaccine, no matter whether they're young, healthy, whether they've had COVID before, whether they want to test every day, vaccines are the only way. And on the very conservative side, it's like, don't tell me what I can do. Uh, I don't like vaccines. It's a conspiracy. You're chipping me, my body, you know, and it's gotten really just political across that. And uh, we just, which is one reason I try to get on the media, we just got to get out, you know, vaccines aren't political, right? Vaccines aren't political, uh, but they're also not a miracle cure. You know, it's not like raising Lazarus from the dead. They have, they do have drawbacks. They're not perfect. There are some side effects. We just need to be open and support people to make their own choice. I also believe, and this is just because it's Texas, I think the more you try to force people into doing something, the less likely many people are going to do. If you just back off, lower the tensions, give people the information, you know, they're going to they're gonna get there. I mean, that's my opinion. Uh, yes, ma'am, I think you were next. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for what you've done, what you do, and what you're going to do. Oh, thank you. Um, my issue is mental health. Yes. You did mention um, addiction, but you did not really men- talk about the underlying issues that cause the addiction. And uh, we haven't done much to destigmatize mental illness, and mental illness does affect, it may be no gender, no class, no social status, it just affects everybody. But we don't really talk about it as much as we should. And now we're going into almost a state of emergency with three, five addictions. And uh, and yes, we are creating hospitals, a situation in Texas, we don't have enough hospitals to provide help to. We don't have enough support in terms of um, non-compliance, because most of these people that go back to the hospital, they don't take their medication. And yet, we can't have um, maybe nurses or med aides that can go to those apartments or houses just to give them medication. They used to do that in Massachusetts. I don't know if they still do. They will do every single day. They will still go to the houses to be medicated, especially in the morning and at night. And that reduced hospitalization a lot. It also reduced uh, emergency, um, emergency, emergency relief, where, where, the, where it's not necessary for them to go to the emergency because they feel suicidal and then the money just goes higher and higher. So what I'm going to do in the future... Okay, so let me just say that everything you said I agree with 110%, okay? Um, in Texas, you can agree over 100%. That's why it's 110%. I agree with you. Um, so, uh, so I had some responsibilities in the mental health arena, and, and, and it's a huge issue. So let me just say, first of all, access is terrible. There's not parity, so people don't get paid. There's a shortage of providers across the board. Uh, we're going to have a, a huge crisis because of, number one, the pandemic, um, and number two, 30% of people, adults who've had COVID, uh, have some type of mental or emotional disorder, usually depression, um, uh, that lasts longer. So we have a huge amount of this. Um, there are some solutions, right? There are, there are some solutions. And I'll just touch on a few things that where we were going before the pandemic, um, just to give you an idea. Number one, I agree with you. We need more inpatient mental hospitals, okay? One flew over the cuckoo's nest, uh, sort of ruined... Uh, inpatient mental care, but there's no reason why people who really need inpatient mental care should not be there. We even made rules like the IMD exclusion, meaning that you can't have, you can't get paid if you have more than 16 beds of an inpatient. Now, we got rid of that during the pandemic because I could do that with a stroke of a pen because it was a public health emergency. So that's sort of gone away now, but as soon as the public health emergency is over, it goes back unless Congress changes that. Um, number two, a commitment, and this is a really big issue, in order to commit a person even for a few days. Look, a person who is psychotic, who thinks that they're hearing voices and, and, you know, that their parents are trying to kill them, they're not going to voluntarily submit to treatment. But if you can get them on three to seven days of treatment, often you can kind of turn them around and move them in. But you can only commit a person if they are of imminent danger to themselves or someone else, meaning they're going to kill themselves or someone else within 24 hours. We tried uh, by regulation, and this needs to be done, to just say they're of, you know, not imminent danger, but they're of severe danger to themselves or someone else. 
Because if you can't prove 24 hours, you can't commit them, and nobody can prove 24 hours. Uh, two other points is that um, um, the people on the streets that you see, about 50% of homeless have a mental illness. Uh, and the ones that you hear are yelling and screaming and, and everything else, uh, people have psychotic breaks in college. That's when they have it, between the time they're 17 to 21. And it's called the first episode of psychosis. If you, don't, if you get them during their first episode, very early in college, and get them in a treatment, you, you change it. But if you miss that first episode and they get a year or two into it, you are like one of our best friends who has a child who's been on the street for three years now, who can't get committed because she's not of imminent danger, but she can't take care of herself she, because she, you missed that opportunity. So we need programs like in elementary school to support emotional. We definitely need programs in college to, to do that. And then there's something else called, I think it's called community-based assertive care or something like that. The idea is, and these are programs that um, if a person is obviously mentally ill, you bring them to Parkland Hospital, um, the, the, no, nothing happens because the, the uh, officer who uh, takes this person to custody has to sit there for six or eight hours. You can't commit the person, they leave. So there are centers that are community-based centers where instead of bringing them to the hospital or jail, you bring them to these uh, community-based centers where they have a community-based intervention. But let me just say, you, there's, you should have you know, a whole morning or afternoon on what to do with mental illness uh, because there, uh, it's not uh, something that you have to bury your, your head in the sand. There are some specific things. It's a long way to go, but there are some specific things that can be done, and thank you very much for bringing that up. Uh, who's next? I got about six more minutes. Yes, sir. And then in the back. Okay. Uh, in, insurance companies, I mean, we can have some Blue Cross Blue Shield or something, so uh, Fortune 29 company is sued, uh, trying to get the flooring back, and uh, he, he spent an ounce of America. What he's finding is just a big, slow-moving, infighting, love-making economy. What do they need to do differently or think differently that helps them? Well, they can help, right, because uh, they can help because they can implement a lot of these types of reforms, you know, on their own. And in fact, you're not seeing it in the anthems of the world, but you're seeing it in big corporations. So big corporations have definitely said, we're not paying for all this episodic care. We're going to start contracting to keep people healthy and moving on. So the companies like the Boeings of the world and people like that are starting to make the changes. But insurance companies... Um, you know, some are a little bit more progressive. Most are really not. They're sort of big, slow-moving machines. And what I'm seeing is, like, they will cut off some of their uh, problematic patients to these small companies so to give the risk to them, which is okay. But I think you need sort of major reform. Like for kidney disease, we decided that, um, you know, 80% of kidney costs now go to people who go to dialysis centers, right? Right. Uh, uh, and I have no idea where, what, the, what the status is, is, but we said in five years, we're going to pay 80% of the money uh, only if you get a transplant or you're on home dialysis and not go to centers. And so we told them, because that's clearly done. So that will change everybody immediately because Medicare owns all those populations. So Medicare could make that change. It's very hard for an individual insurance company to make that change. But you're right. You're right. I think insurance companies are not as bad as people make them out to be. But they're big, slow-moving, bureaucratic, and controlled. I think, yes, ma'am. Masks. Um, so, um, so, and I'm just going to give you my. Um, if you're in an indoor crowded space and uh, you're at risk of having a COVID or transmitting it, masks help around the margin. They're not a big, you know. They, they don't, they're not a panacea, but they do uh, sort of help in indoor crowded spaces. Um, personally, if you have a bunch of vaccinated people and everybody's okay, I really don't care. I don't wear a mask around vaccinated people. I go to A&M games with 105,000 people. Um, if you're outdoors, uh, there's really been no transmission outdoors. I mean, there's really not. There's no reason to wear a mask outdoors. Um, under five years old, I am of the camp of the rest of the world that kids under five should not wear a mask, period, full stop. Um, and under 12, 
only, uh, and that is the World Health Organization, under five. Nobody in the world wears masks under five aside from the United States, and there's no data to show that that helps. Five to 12 really depends on how severe the outbreak is there and if you have special needs. But the rest of the world said um, you can use them in five to 12 um, under certain circumstances and only if the child feels comfortable doing it. Okay, so I think we are way off the deep end on masks uh, in the country. But they do, they, do, they do provide some protection. Adults, for sure, in the indoor crowded spaces, you know, they do, they do help. I'm vaccinated, I had a booster. I, I, I don't feel, I mean, I'll wear a mask when people ask me to, or, uh, you know, maybe we felt like we needed some at the, at the, at the state fair and some of the arenas, but, um, I mean, I mean, that's sort of the bottom line. They do help, particularly in adults, indoor crowded, outdoors don't worry about them. People in the park wearing a mask is crazy, right? And I'm not so much on masks, uh, particularly in younger children. Who had another question? Uh, uh, will you, yes ma'am, you, and then sir, and then I might have to pop out because I want to go get some money from those fund managers. Go Tigers. Yeah, this, this, is, this is part of the CDC reform that really needs to happen. Um, I, I'm not a big government person. I really am not. But, but the CDC gives out billions and billions and billions of dollars and doesn't have anything in return for it, like how you need to report. Let me just give you an example. Only 24 states report uh, uh, hospitalizations among children for COVID. Only 24 states, okay? That's crazy. How are we gonna make decisions about children if only 24 states? Only 11 states report testing in children. Um, so there is no uniformity. There needs to be a big overhaul of the information systems. Like I said last night, we wanted to know how many ventilators people were using. I'm calling hospitals individually in New York City like half the night trying to figure out who's got what. There was no system for that. It's a better system now because Medicare said, you know, all the hospitals are under Medicare and Seema Burma says, if you don't report this, you're not Medicare eligible, you don't get paid. So everybody started reporting. But the public health side is the CDC side and, and you are absolutely right. Things like reporting. Now public health is still a state and local. The federal government does not have authority except things like uh, global travel or potentially interstate, which is why you wear a mask on a plane. But the federal government does not have public health control, so the states do. But things like reporting. Yes. Excellent reporting. There, there is. And the way you do it is you give mo most of these are funded by CDC, federal government, the CDC. The CDC has to have something in return, meaning that if we're going to give you the money, you need to report according to a standard. That is not so heavy government. We really need that to understand. Your point is really well made, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really important point. I had one other person. Yeah, one more question. One more question. Yes, sir, in the back. I'm sorry. Yes.
So, so, so there needs to be. Let me just tell you that it was a daily conversation with the vice president in the Situation Room about, and with Seema Verma, who ran Medicare, about how to open up nursing homes. Um, because you don't want to have loneliness. On the other hand, you don't want the continued holocaust of people in nursing homes dying of COVID. So, like I said last night, the, as soon as point-of-care testing became available, um, I used the DPA to buy every single point-of-care test and machine and send them to nursing homes um, because that would allow people to be tested every time they come in to make sure they were negative before they got in. That's, that, literally, that's how much we prioritized and what we did. Um, but you are exactly right. Um, the, Uni the United Kingdom, uh, even before, uh, before COVID, has a minister, the minister of loneliness. Uh, that's how much... Uh, it is an important issue in the UK, particularly among the elderly, and how much it's been elevated. Um, again, uh, I'm looking at opportunities. What can this church do? Um, this church can do so much uh, with visitation or, you know, even virtual. Virtual is not the same as being there, but it's better than, you know, when we say, everybody talked about social distancing. I, I, I hated that term because it was physical distancing, not social distancing. We don't want social distancing. We want physical distancing. But your point is well made, and uh, the Minister of Loneliness I got to meet because we had him at a 2030 Health, uh, Healthy People 2030 conference. Uh, we brought him to the United States to talk about how they approach that from an, um, from an emotional standpoint. So, look, um, these are complex problems. Uh, I don't expect to have any solutions today, but I hope maybe think in a different, you know, maybe a different way or some different aspects. And I am very happy to supply a bunch of material that you could put on the website. And, of course, all my slides last night today you know, anything you want, please distribute. But thank you very much. Thank you.